The shocking truth behind the five muscle car rear ends that changed history. Every legend you've heard about muscle cars is a lie the truth lived out back. 1969 had everything Woodstock shaking the world Apollo landing on the moon, and somewhere in small town America, a kid named Jimmy launched his Chevelle so hard, the rear axle ripped clean off the line. That moment summed up the truth nobody wanted to admit. The rear end was the final link between 1,000 horsepower dreams and brutal reality. Ford had the 9-inch Chrysler, the Dana 60 GM, the 12 Bolt, and Mopar's 8 and 3 quarter names whispered in drag strips back roads and garages like passwords to a secret society. These weren't just chunks of iron, they were survival. The difference between crossing the finish line first or standing helpless beside twisted metal where your axle used to be. But here's the twist. While nearly every muscle car in America trusted these bulletproof solid axles, one manufacturer threw the rule book out the window. They built something so radical, it looked suicidal. It shouldn't have worked, and yet it changed everything. Trust me, that last one still starts arguments raging today. So which rear end do you think truly ruled the muscle car era? Drop your pick in the comments. Ford 9-inch. Born in 1957 for Ford's full-size models, the 9-inch wasn't just another rear axle. It was a cast-iron nuclear bunker engineered to survive the kind of punishment rival axles only prayed they'd never see. Folks said Ford made it for civilian use, but in reality it was built like a device to repel invasion, a clandestine mechanical weapon for the muscle era. The biggest advantage was the dropout third member. Where GM's 12 bolt and Mopar's 8 and 3 quarter forced you to split the housing and wallow in gear oil to change ratios, the 9 inch lets you pull the entire brain out the front in under an hour. For drag racers, that's battlefield logistics, swap a third member like changing ammunition. Racers carried multiple third members, 3.00 for cruising 4.11 or 4.56 for the strip, and no factory had ever advertised that capability. Still, everyone in the pits whispered about it. The technical specs are where the 9-inch truly dominates. A 9.0-inch ring gear gives a larger contact patch than GM's 8.2 and 8.5 designs, spreading load and resisting tooth failure under massive torque. The pinion support uses three bearings, essentially bodyguards for the pinion eliminating deflection during violent launches. Yes, that extra bearing and heft cost 2-3% efficiency in drivetrain losses, but the trade-off is near absolute durability. Put simply, Ford's 9-inch traded 2-3% efficiency for immortality. Spline counts mark another battleground. Stock small block cars ran 28 splines, Boss 302s and 4. Two eight Cobra jets got 31 splines, and modern builders pushed to 35 spline aftermarket shafts for four-digit horsepower tolerance. If you find a center section stamped with a bold N, you found a nodular iron case, the rare tougher metallurgy that resists cracking like armor. There are gotchas too. Not all 9-inch housings are identical big bearing versus small bearing differences matter, and pre-1972 through hardened 31 splines can be safely shortened while later induction hardened shafts will snap if you chop into the soft zone. Junkyard hunters learned those lessons the hard way. And then there's the scandal everyone pretended not to see. Racers whispered tales bordering on heresy. Chevy loyalists and Mopar diehards secretly slipped Ford 9 inches into their cars, ground off casting marks, repainting housings to pass them as factory bits. It was brand betrayal in plain sight, a conspiracy no one admitted aloud. Because in the pits, the truth was simple when the tree went green, allegiance meant nothing. Only the nine inch stood tall while the others shattered. Ford stopped fitting them in passenger cars after 1986, but the aftermarket refused to let the story die. Today, you can buy NASCAR style fabricated housings, brand new nodular third members, and alloy 35 spline shafts stronger than any factory original. It's no longer just an axle, it's an arsenal, the mechanical armory of a generation. But when Chrysler entered the arms race, they didn't chase versatility. They chased raw, unblinking indestructibility. Dana 60. When Chrysler faced the torque monster known as the 426 Hemi and the 440 Magnum, they didn't ask for good enough. They went to Dana Corporation with a demand whispered like a military order, build us something that will never break. The result was the Dana 60 less a rear axle and more a weapon disguised as farm equipment. 
The numbers alone were terrifying. A 9.75-inch ring gear made the Ford 9 inches 9.0 look modest and dwarfed GM's 12 bolt at 8.875. That extra diameter wasn't just bragging rights, it meant more surface area for torque transfer, less chance of stripping teeth under load. The 35 spline axle shafts were massive, often measuring 1.5 inches across, compared to Ford's common 28 to 31 spline shafts. To racers, they looked more like industrial pry bars than car parts. Those crowbar thick shafts gave unshakable confidence, but they also added nearly 80 pounds more weight than a comparable Ford 9 inch a hidden tax racers quietly carried. The housing itself was overbuilt thick cast iron that could shrug off shock loads that would shatter thinner designs. The pinion design added to the myth. With its larger pinion shaft and huge bearing support, the Dana 60 resisted deflection in ways lighter axles couldn't. Engineers claimed its gear mesh pattern stayed consistent even under four-digit horsepower, where the Ford 9-inch with its third bearing and steeper pinion offset sacrificed a few percentage points of efficiency and the GM 12-bolt risked accelerated wear. NASCAR teams confirmed it early. At 190 miles per hour for 500 miles, engines detonated and transmissions scattered, but the Dana 60 endured. On the street, legends spread of racers blowing big blocks and shredding clutches, yet the axles stayed solid, still ready to launch again. Hot Rod magazine and early NASCAR coverage echoed the same truth engines blown transmissions scattered, but the Dana 60 endured. That phrase became gospel among racers, proof that Chrysler's destroyer wasn't just marketing hype, but battle-tested fact. But whispers followed. Chrysler knew the Dana 60's sheer bulk was a liability in lighter, a bodies like the Dart or Duster. Extra unsprung weight slowed response, hurt ride quality, and stole tenths at the strip. Yet the brochures never admitted this. Mopar ads painted it only as never break, burying the truth to preserve the aura. Some enthusiasts believe this silence wasn't oversight, it was deliberate misdirection to keep the axle's image untouchable. And perhaps the biggest conspiracy of all, Dana didn't just build an axle, they built a weapon. A component so brutally over-engineered, it blurred the line between car part and battlefield tool born from farm machinery and semi-trucks, then slipped under muscle cars like contraband steel. When Mopar fans call it the destroyer, they aren't exaggerating, they're repeating a truth Detroit itself tried to cloak. GM 12 Bolt While Ford built bunkers and Chrysler forged weapons, GM quietly chose a different strategy, the Goldilocks solution. Not too heavy like the Dana 60, not overbuilt like the Ford 9-inch, but strong enough to survive the big block wars without dragging unnecessary weight. On paper, it looked modest. In practice, it became the sweet spot of the muscle car era. The key was in the details. Most rear ends of the day used 10 bolts to secure the ring gear, but GM's 12 bolt added two more, a seemingly small change that translated into tighter clamping force and far less chance of gear deflection under shock loads. The carrier itself was designed for optimal stress distribution, spreading torque evenly instead of allowing localized fractures. And the 30 spline axle shafts struck a perfect balance thick enough to hold serious power, yet lighter than Dana's crowbar like 35 splines. In the real world, that meant a properly built 12 bolt could comfortably handle 600 horsepower more than enough for the nastiest Chevelle SS 454s, high revving Z28s, or GTO, judges running Ram Air. 600 horsepower strong yet cheap enough to yank from a junkyard Nova. That balance is what made it the poor man's Dana 60. Yet it remained civilized enough for Monday commutes. Street one night, strip the next and never complain. Budget racers adored it for another reason, availability. Unlike the Ford 9-inch or Dana 60, which often required hunting and heavy modification, the 12 bolt was everywhere. Junkyards across America were filled with them, pulled from Chevelle, Novus, Monte Carlos, even trucks. Some whispered it was the poor man's Dana 60 away for everyday builders to tap into big block strength without bankrupting themselves. And yet here's the conspiracy twist. GM never branded it a legend. They didn't market it as the best. Instead, they buried it in production volume, letting racers quietly discover its brilliance for themselves. Some believe this was deliberate that GM downplayed the 12 bolt to keep attention on flashy engines while hiding its most balanced masterpiece in plain sight. For the street and strip, it was the axle of the people. Reliable, strong, affordable, and always underestimated. 
But Mopar wasn't satisfied with balance. They wanted something smarter, something that could outthink everyone. Mopar, eight and three quarter. If Ford's nine inch was a bunker and Dana's 60 was a tank, then Mopar's eight and three quarter was something more dangerous, a scalpel sharpened in the shadows. It didn't scream about its strength with weight or brute force. Instead, Chrysler's engineers designed something leaner, lighter, and some say deliberately kept quiet as if they feared the secret might be stolen. Whispers from inside Auburn Hills claim management instructed engineers never to oversell the rear end, afraid that Ford or GM would strip mine its geometry and erase Mopar's only ace. Like Ford's 9-inch, it featured a removable center section, but Mopar twisted the idea into something smarter. Gear ratio changes weren't just convenient, they were strategic. Racers could pull the carrier swap in a new set and be ready for the next challenge in hours, a battlefield rearmament disguised as maintenance. But the real conspiracy lay deeper, the pinion offset and geometry. Unlike most rears that tore themselves apart under stress, the eight and three quarters seemed to fight back clamping tighter the harder you hit it. Some mechanics swore it was intentional, a hidden weapon buried in plain sight. On paper, its 8.75-inch ring gear looked like an underdog compared to Ford's 9-inch or Dana's 9.75. But Mopar engineers knew numbers could lie. With better tooth engagement and lighter rotating mass, it punched far above its weight a rear end that seemed to defy the math. That's why street lore is full of stories like Tony's Dart, a small block car that humiliated machines with double the budget. His rivals walked away muttering that his axle was cheating physics. And yet Chrysler never crowned it as a flagship. They downplayed it, tucked it into cars without ceremony, almost as if corporate bosses wanted the eight and three quarter to stay underground. Meanwhile, racers treated it like contraband, a whispered advantage passed between those who knew. The aftermarket eventually immortalized it, refusing to alter the geometry proof that some designs weren't just good, they were untouchable. Not the heaviest, not the flashiest, but perhaps the most cunning. The eight and three quarter wasn't just underrated, it was a Trojan horse carrying brilliance hidden in silence. Corvette IRS 1963. In 1963, Chevrolet lit a fuse no one expected. While Ford Chrysler and GM's own divisions were doubling down on iron-solid rear axles, the kind built to take abuse and ask for more, the Corvette engineers broke ranks. They didn't just tweak the formula, they tore it up. Out went the trusted solid axle, and in came something that muscle car loyalists saw as betrayal independent rear suspension. To the drag strip crowd, it was heresy. To road racers, it was prophecy. Technically, it was nothing short of revolution. Independent suspension meant each wheel could react to the pavement on its own, clawing for grip where solid axles simply skated. That reduced unsprung weight, giving the Corvette sharper acceleration, stronger braking and cornering agility that muscle cars had never known. It was lighter than a comparable solid axle trimming pounds where it mattered most. In racing terms, it wasn't just a rear end, it was an entirely new philosophy. Whispers suggest GM Brass never truly embraced it. To them, the Corvette's IRS was too refined, too precise a betrayal of the brute force image that sold Camaro's Chevelle and Nova's. Some insiders claim the Corvette was intentionally isolated, treated as a laboratory experiment because executives feared what would happen if this technology spilled into mainstream muscle. It wasn't supposed to define the future. It was supposed to stay locked in the glass case of America's sports car. But the truth is, it couldn't be contained. Road racing results began to pile up. Corvettes weren't just fast in straight lines, they were dominating in corners. By the 1970s and 1980s, other manufacturers were forced to follow. By the 1990s, IRS wasn't an experiment anymore, it was the industry standard. The conspiracy angle lingers. The Corvette's IRS wasn't just engineering, it was a quiet declaration that raw strength alone wouldn't rule forever. The muscle car future would belong to precision balance and control, and GM had been testing it decades ahead of everyone else. Five rear ends, five philosophies, but all born from the same hidden war. The Ford 9-inch said, build it like a bunker. The Dana 60 said, make it unbreakable. The GM 12 Bolt found balance. The Mopar 8 and 3 quarter proved brains beat brute force. And the Corvette's IRS dared to rewrite the rulebook entirely. 
These weren't just chunks of iron, they were the guardians of every burnout, every quarter mile, every legend. Because all the horsepower in the world means nothing if you can't put it to the ground. Which one do you trust? Tell us in the comments and don't forget to like, share and subscribe.